this is part one of module five. Module five is going to kind of look at insects in a more ecological role. What is their behavior? How do they communicate? And how, uh, how are they social? What kind of sociality groups do they have? And so this is part one and it's only going to cover behavior and communication. And some highlights from this video, so you're excited to keep watching, are all the different ways that insects can actually talk to each other, and there's a lot more than you might originally think, and kind of basic behaviors, and can insects learn? So hang, hang in there, it's going to be super awesome, so you should continue watching. We're going to start off talking about instincts. You probably know what an instinct is, but if you want a nice scientific definition, an instinct is a complex behavior that an organism innately knows without having been taught. And a really great example of this are baby sea turtles that hatch and just book it straight to the ocean. And there have been some scientific studies that show that baby sea turtles use the moon to navigate and they also navigate uh, using uh, magnetic fields. But no one like came up to the baby sea turtle and was like, hey, the ocean's that way. Look at the moon. Look at these like magnetic fields. The baby sea turtle just hatched and just made it to the ocean. Well, some of them make it. Not all of them. <laughs> anyway, so this is a really complex behavior that is just innately known by the sea turtle as soon as it hatches. A couple other examples of instincts are just feeding. So you, you know what to eat. No one has to tell you what to eat. Um, mating, no one has to tell you what your mates are, and just kind of general orientation to stimuli. Like, you know if you're cold, then you just go towards the sun, or if you're a night-dwelling creature and it's bright outside, then you're not going to walk outside. One of the other really kind of interesting behaviors is migration, because a lot of migration in, say, birds is actually taught. So, um, there is this endangered bird species, I don't remember what it is, but it'll be down there. Anyway, and they're trying to get the populations back up and train them to fly back to their original breeding grounds. And so there's literally like a guy in a plane that had a like bird face on it and was training the young birds how to get to their new migration habitat. And so with birds, that's really important. All their migration is just like, hey, there, I'm a little bird. I'm going to follow the big bird so I know where to go. And then the next year, they're the big bird and little birds follow them. So what's really interesting is that monarch butterflies that have a really crazy, huge migration pattern. And you go all the way from Mexico to like Canada and just, they don't. No one really knows how the monarch butterflies do it. There's some hypotheses like, oh, there's like the sun and polarized light and magnetic fields, but like halfway, like no one butterfly can make it from Mexico to Canada. It's too long. So this mass of migrating butterflies literally has tons of generations that make it. And so the butterflies just emerge and know where to go. And that's that's pretty amazing. I mean, we still don't know how they do it. So some behaviors are pretty simple, like, hey, I'm cold, go to the sunlight. And some behaviors are really, really complex, like getting, getting yourself from Mexico to Canada. One of the things we talk a lot about in biology is orientation. And we have a specific term for this, and by a term I mean we have like eight. But the main term is taxis, and taxis is a directional response to a stimulus. And so if you have light, then you can have an organism that either goes towards the light or away from the light. And as long as that response is directional to the stimulus of the light, then it is a taxis. And that's specifically different from something like uh, kinesis, which is a non-directional response. So if there's light, then the organism could just scatter anywhere. And that's different from a tropism, which is specifically like a plant thing, how plants grow in relation to different stimulus. So we're going to focus on taxis for this module. There are two kinds of taxis. There is positive taxis and negative taxis. And positive taxis means that you go towards the thing that is causing you to move. And negative taxis is moving away from the thing that you are trying to avoid. So if you took a quick look at this list, which is really long, but there's a lot of them, Anyway, you'll notice that we just took the term taxis and stuck it 
to a prefix, and then that prefix is supposed to tell you what that directional behavior is attributed to. So one of the really kind of the major examples that I'm going to talk about is phototaxis, which is orientation in relation to light, phonotaxis, which is orientation in relation to sound. However, the moths that I was talking about before that would just drop out of this out of the sky when bats are coming by, that is not a taxis because it's a random change. So that would be a kinesis because the bat sends out echolocation, it hits the moth, the moth just like stops flying and drops. It's not moving away from the sound so much as it's just like hoping it's not getting eaten. Anyway, so there's a few others. So there's thigmotaxis, which is uh, stimulus in relation to touch, and thermotaxis, which is orientation in relation to temperature. And you can take a look at all the other ones, but there's barometric pressure, moisture, gravitational pull, wind, and chemicals, and just all this crazy stuff. Like, some of them's even, like, current and tide change. It's pretty legit. Can insects learn? Yes! Yes, they can. So here's an example that I talked a little bit about in one of my other videos, but this is a praying mantis sitting on a hummingbird feeder and is catching a hummingbird. And so the praying mantis has learned that food comes to it if it sits on this hummingbird feeder. And so that's pretty fantastic. I think that's awesome. I love it when bugs like reverse the food chain. Anyway, so that would be a example of classical conditioning. So classical conditioning is like Pavlov's dog where an organism will associate two different stimuli to like be connected together and that's pretty much how we do all of our learning. We just take two different stimuli and associate them. So the mantis has associated this bright red hummingbird feeder with food that shows up by itself and is just sitting there which is awesome. There's imprinting, which um, shows that some insects do, but imprinting is more of a kind of bird thing, and that's a phase-sensitive learning. So when you see like people with like duck puppets and like little ducklings are following the duck puppet, that's imprinting, and it's really important that, especially in birds, that the thing that they imprint on looks like a bird, or else you have little ducklings that follow people around in the park, and it's cute, but not necessarily good for the ducklings. And then you have habituation, which is just eventually you ignore a stimulus that keeps recurring. So a good example of this is you wear your clothes and you don't realize that you're wearing them anymore, or maybe you do now that it's said it, but you kind of just ignore that you're wearing clothes after a while because it's always on your skin and it's something you do every day, so your brain is just like, I can ignore the stimulus. So one of the great examples of the classical conditioning are the bomb-sniffing wasps. And we've been talking a little bit about it on the discussion forums, but basically it's really awesome. Because we can now use wasps as kind of bomb-sniffing dogs. So if there's an area where you don't want to bring your dog into because you know, it's an arson or there's broken glass or you know there's like bombs, then you can bring this um, little contraption that, and there's like a picture there right now. Um, there's this little contraption that you put the wasps in and you like fan the odor in and then when they congregate in the middle you can determine their behavior with a software that's just like recorded and you hook it up to your laptop and then your laptop um, does all this like math and then figures out the intensity and the quickness that the wasps are behaving and reacting to the stimulus and so um, it'll tell you pretty much the like how much of that scent is there and what what scent it is. And how you can actually train these wasps to do this is you take a wasp and it has two different behaviors. It has a, hey, I found a host that I can parasitize behavior, and it has a, yay, I found food behavior. And so you'll introduce the wasp to like a caterpillar and you'll introduce the wasp to the caterpillar when there's a scent of like vanilla or whatever you want to them to be accustomed to. And so they'll see the caterpillar and do their like host behavior dance behavior. And then um, since you've introduced them to that host with this scent of vanilla all the time, eventually you can just spray or drop vanilla into their cage and they'll 
have the same response as if caterpillars were there. Similarly, you can train them to food. So if you give them like sugar water and then have the scent of like chocolate in there, eventually when you just have the scent of chocolate, they'll do this like little, hey, I found food dance. And so when you go out into the field and if that scent is present and then goes through this contraption, the wasp will either do a behavior that's um, indicative of parasitoids or of hosts or a behavior that's indicative of food. And so you can tell which scent is there and in what intensity, which is super awesome. In Europe, they have something pretty similar um, with honeybees, except with like, instead of full body behavior, the honeybees like have like stick their tongues out. And so it's a little bit harder to measure, but it is marketable in Europe right now. So hopefully we can get this up and going in the States currently. So we're moving on to communication now, and the major part of communication is to know who you're talking to and know how to communicate with whoever you're trying to communicate with. So there's two major concepts and ideas about communication, and the first is inter-specific communication, and this is communication between you and a different species. So for example, the monarch caterpillar here is displaying warning coloration. Hey, other things that aren't me or related to me, please don't eat me because you will die. So that's what it's communicating. And the other is intra-specific communication, and this is communication between you and your species. And a lot of this is mating. Sometimes in, like, you social insects, it'll be kin recognition. So when you see ants, they, like, touch antennae, and they're like, hey, who are you? That's what they're doing. They're trying to figure out who the other person is or other ant is and are communicating within their species. One way I always remember to make sure I get the two straight is like interstate highways, like I-N-T-E-R. Interstate highways go in between states, and interspecific communication goes in between species. So that's, that's my cheesy way of remembering it, so hopefully it helps you. One of the ways insects communicate is via visual communication. So this can incorporate anything from color patterns, iridescence, uh, different morphologies or actually just different behaviors that have different kind of cues depending on who they're actually trying to talk to and communicate with. One of the ways that insects communicate and it's kind of the most obvious it would be through sexual dimorphism and sexual dimorphism is when there's a polyphenism or two different morphologies in a species and that morphology is based on whether you're male or female and so um, birds have this all the time so like cardinals the males are really bright and pretty and red and the females are that kind of grayish dull color but lots and lots of organisms have this have this kind of morphology that's different between the sexes. Sexual dimorphism is seen in insects a lot as well. So the Hercules beetle has this like giant horn on the front of its head and only the males have this and the females don't. Another example are the morpho butterflies that have this really bright pretty iridescence color and the females are a little bit more drab and a little bit more brown. And these sexual dimorphisms, whether they be like strictly anatomical or um, a color pattern, is really important for their mating communications, depending if you're a beetle and how big that horn, in it, horn is and how well you can like compete and push other males off of your female and stuff, or the morpho, how bright and how colorful and how stunning your iridescence is, are all cues that the female uses to distinguish like, hey, you're really attractive. Another really good example is with the jumping spiders. So in addition to having the males having all this like really bright iridescence, so like that jumping spider right down there has like these bright iridescent legs. Jumping spiders also have this really elaborate mating ritual where they'll like wave their legs around and move their abdomen around, and, like tap on the ground. And all of this uh, color, color sensory information and how strong how vigorously he can dance is all really really important for the female to determine whether or not that jumping spider is a good mate for her so a big question for a while was like what is the advantage of being a male and having these like really super bright colors obviously you can mate but you know you could be picked off by a bird or a different predator pretty easily and it was and it's been thought like it's been theorized that the Females want to be camouflaged and blend into their surroundings because they're putting so much energy into their eggs. Like they don't want their their 
their eggs to die, they don't want to be picked off early until they mate with the proper male or deposit the eggs in a good spot, or if you give live birth to live young, then you want to be alive long enough to actually produce offspring. And so you want to camouflage so you live longer. Whereas the males, it's much more important for them to pass along sperm. Sperm aren't that expensive, and the more females they mate with, the more fit they are. And so they're willing to sacrifice longevity for the ability to mate with more females. Because in the game of life, it doesn't really matter how how long you live, it matters how many offspring you produce. And for the males, sperm is really easy, there's really no incubation time that it takes to do it, so if you're bright and colorful and mate with a ton, a ton of females, and you're way more successful than a male that maybe lives longer but isn't actually considered attractive by anyone. Poor guy, he's alright. Another example of visual communication is light. So we all know fireflies or lightning bugs or lightning beetles if you're an entomologist. Anyway, so you'll see those flashes in the summer, but all of those different flashing patterns are different species. And in addition to the different flashing patterns, the height at which these organisms fly also indicate different species. And so you can have like tons of different species out at the same time, and the females will recognize only the ones that are flying in the right spot or are flashing in the right pattern in the right spot. There are some crafty females, they'll be of like one species, and mimic the available flash of a different female. And when the male of that other species visits the first female, who is being all mimicky and trickstery, when the male comes to her, they obviously can't mate, but she eats him. So that's, that's a good way of tricking food to come to you. Sometimes insects communicate to us. You probably never really thought of it that way, but anytime you see a bee that just like flies by and you're like, oh my god, I don't want to touch it. That's communication. That's visual communication from the bee because it's black and yellow and you recognize that color pattern and it's like, ow, that thing can hurt me because it's flying by and so you leave it alone. And that is what we call warning coloration or aposomatic coloration. And so like your wasps are a huge example of this. Um, your monarch butterflies, because they eat milkweed, which has cardiac glycoside in it, both the caterpillar and the butterfly have this like bright coloration, like don't eat me, I'm toxic. I took a picture of the stinging rose caterpillar, which instead of just being toxic, has all these like spikes on it. And if you brush up against it, then they'll inject venom into you. Um, and then, like, the Black Widow, for example, has, like, that red hourglass shape on its abdomen. And mostly, this aposomatic coloration is reds, blacks, yellows, or oranges, and different patterns. So, stay away from me. It's what they're telling everything that isn't them. For a while, scientists weren't really sure how aposomatic coloration came to be a big thing, because their idea was that... If you had a mutation that made you stand out more because you were toxic, there would only be like one or like two of you ever. And so once you became more visible, even if you were toxic, no birds or anything had learned that you were toxic. And so you would stand out more, the bird would come over, it would eat you, and then that gene would disappear whether or not you were toxic. Because either the bird would die, the bird would throw up, it would get sick, it didn't matter because the organism that had those genes was dead. And then this study came out that showed that most of the time when a butterfly or another aposomatically colored organism was caught by a bird, the bird would like take a bite out of it, but be like, eh, this is gross, and then spit it back out. And so while the butterfly wasn't like 100% okay, it was still okay enough to fly around and not like die. It could still mate, it could still like get food and continue on its merry way. And so that study, again, kind of just showed, hey, like, aposomatic coloration as we know of it could have actually evolved because the organism doesn't usually die when it's being eaten. Because aposomatic coloration works so well, you tend to get mimics because of its efficiency. And so there's two major strategies for mimicry. The first is Mullerian mimicry, and this is when two harmful or two toxic things will look similar to each other. And a good example of this is like all of your wasps and bees. Like bees in general all 
pretty much look the same and they're all like yellow and black and then the wasps are pretty much all look the same they're um yellow and black and not as fuzzy as the bees or you get some that are black with red wings or um so you get this kind of convergence of appearance because all these things that are toxic are mimicking each other and then you have the opposite end of the spectrum, which is Batesian mimicry. And this is when a non-toxic or non-harmful thing mimics something that is harmful or is toxic. So a good example are your robber flies that mimic bumblebees or carpenter bees. Um, all of those hoverflies that I was showing you earlier about like all the different crazy kinds and how closely they look to wasps, those are all like Batesian mimics. I'm sure you've all heard of the monarch butterfly. I mean, it's like the state insect for a hundred bazillion states. Anyway, the monarch butterfly has a mimic. Uh, it's called the viceroy butterfly, and it looks so similar to the monarch butterfly, as you can see there. The only good way to really tell them apart is that the viceroy has an extra black line on it that the monarch doesn't. And for a while, it was thought that the viceroy was um, perfectly safe to eat, and that it was a Batesian mimic of the monarch butterfly but some research came out in the 90s i think that pretty much showed that birds also didn't really like the the viceroys and so they're actually mullerian mimics and so that was really cool because like science showed that one hypothesis that we had thought was wrong and then we had shifted our beliefs and views based on that evidence and so that was really cool nature has some amazing amazing Feats of mimicry. So here's the atlas moth, and as you can tell, the side of its wings look like snakes. Like, that's awesome. And then you have a, a type of caterpillar, it's a hawk moth caterpillar, and it can flatten its head to look like a snake. And that's really amazing as well. And the kind of idea behind this is that insects' main predators are lizards and birds, and the main predator of lizards and birds are snakes. So Imagine, like, a bird flying along, I'm going to eat this cute little caterpillar. And then all of a sudden, the caterpillar looks like a snake. What? Like, that would be terrifying. Like, if I was eating a steak and all of a sudden it looked like a lion, like, that would be scary. And so, this kind of, like, really amazing mimicry is just to, like, scare and startle predators away. There are other kind of mechanisms to startle your predators as well. So one example is the mantises or the goliath stick insect or grasshoppers that they're kind of camouflage -y. And then their hind wings are this like really bright red or black or sometimes they have eye spots, sometimes they're bright yellow. And these are all just to be like, oh no, a predator is coming on me, coming on to me. And then you flash your hind wings up and all of a sudden something that you thought was your prey is like flashy, it's like bright crazy colors and then it's like scary and the same is kind of the idea behind eye spots as well eye spots are thought to mimic vertebrate eyes specifically like owls and so if you like a predator comes up to you like a small bird or a lizard and you flash these things look like, that look like owl eyes and hopefully your predator is like oh no you're an owl and will like fly away or go somewhere else to eat something else and so these kind of scare tactics are seen a lot in insects and it's really kind of cool and then i wanted to talk about camouflage for like a teensy teensy bit while it's not directly related to communication it's definitely an interesting behavior um, in addition to morphology that insects and other things have i have some of my favorite mimicry is like bird poop because it's really ingenious like birds really want fresh fruit food all the time it's part of their ecology it takes a lot of energy to fly. You can't be burdened down with too much weight in your stomach. So that's why birds usually go for berries or nuts or insects, high protein, high sugar foods that don't take up too much weight and you can still metabolize them pretty quickly and you can fly. Um, so rustling around in your own bird poop is not particularly helpful when that is, when your goal is to find fresh food. So some insects and some spiders will actually mimic bird poop uh, to avoid detection. And so that works for the caterpillar. Birds don't eat bird poop and they'll just like pass over the caterpillar and it's fine. But the spider is particularly ingenious because not only will the birds not 
eat their own bird poop and not visit their own bird poop. But the spider mainly eats flies, or this one does. And so flies are attracted to bird poop. And so the flies will come and be like, oh, look at this little pile of bird poop. This is going to be awesome. And the spider's like, mwah. And then, like, eats all the spiders. And it's, like, total trickery and awesome. And this... This is an assassin bug, and yes, that is a pile of dead ants on its back. Um, this assassin bug is main predator is ants, but for a while no one really knew why the assassin bug was stacking dead insects on its back. And so some scientists found that jumping spiders are the assassin bug's main predator, or this one's main predator. And so they did this experiment where they took assassin bugs that were naked and assassin bugs that had giant piles of ants on their back and then jumping spiders would be placed into the same cage as either or and they found that by piling the ants on top of the assassin bugs back it actually changes its visual cues enough that the that the spider no longer recognizes it as prey and they found this even with decoys so they used real assassin bugs naked and with piles of ants on its back and they did, did the same thing with decoys naked decoys and decoys with piles of dead ants on its back and in both cases the jumping spiders were less likely to eat the ones that had ants on their back and they think that it's just a clever way of like distorting your features enough that you're not able to be recognized as a prey item anymore so in short there's a lot of visual communication but Sound communication is equally as important for many, many insects. And if you haven't watched the part of my other video, which you can go to right down there and click it, um, I talked a bit about ears and where all the ears are on all the different insects and what, like, what they do other than hear things I mean, obviously but if you want a bit more information about ears other than the fact that they exist then you can click and jump to that other part of the video if you didn't watch it or don't remember it so there are a lot of different ways to produce sound and i don't have a lot of like fancy images for this because well like you can't see sound right so i have links to a lot of videos upcoming so when i'm like talking and there's like this powerpoint slide next to me forever you can like click the video and watch it and it's it's pretty cool so some of the ways to produce sound is stridulation and that is just rubbing a body part against another body part so your grasshoppers and crickets and stuff are a really good example of this so they'll rub their legs or they'll rub their wings together and they're usually like ribbed of some sort to give a little bit extra like uh, friction and a little extra like pitch and modulation to it and then you have drumming which is I'm I'm most familiar with the jumping spiders but I know that some cockroaches do it as well and this is when you tap the ground or tap yourself in a pattern like a drumming pattern and with jumping spiders specifically a lot of them uh, in addition to being brightly colored and like waving their legs around like crazy, will also add drumming into their dances. And so the sound and visual cues are really important for the mating procedures of the jumping spider. This is a species of water boatman, and it is the loudest animal on the planet when adjusted for its body size. And so it actually produces a sound so loud that it's about 78 decibels, and that's about as loud as a train, like, going past you and, like, honking. They mainly live at the bottom of rivers, which is why you don't hear them that much, and in Europe, so if you don't live in Europe, you won't hear them. But if you lived in Europe, you might not hear them that often because they mainly sit at the bottom of rivers, and the sound doesn't travel too well from the water to the air. But if you are standing on the bank of this river and these things are at the bottom, you can still hear them, which is just like amazing that they're that loud. And they make this sound by rubbing their adiagus against their abdomen. And so there's a, when it when it first came out, it, you can imagine all like the silly titles of articles that came out to describe this new phenomenon. One of the ideas behind why they're so loud is because they might not have any auditory predators. So one thing that keeps cicadas from being loud, but not like deafeningly loud, is that a lot of birds will hear them and then if they're too loud, the birds can find them easier and then eat them. 
So the idea with this water boatman is that sexual selection has just kind of gone awry and gone really crazy, that they have no auditory predators yet. And so the males keep having to be louder and louder and louder and louder to compete with other males. And so it's kind of this like awry sexual selection that happened with them. Another example of sound production is just vibrating a body part really quickly. And this is different than stridulation because stridulation is specific, specifically rubbing one body part against another body part, but this is just vibrating that one body part. And an example of this is cicadas. They have this organ called the timbal, and you can actually tell if you have a male cicada because you can pick it up and look under the wings and see the timbal organs. And they vibrate really quickly to make that distinct cicada buzzing sound. Usually this sound is used to attract mates. The cicadas will climb to like the tops of the trees, even though they're a little bit more exposed to birds and stuff, but their sound travels so much better when they're higher, and so they'll just like go up there and be like, I don't care if I'm like in the way of birds, I'm going to sing my heart out so all these females can come find me and like see how amazingly attractive I am. Cicadas um, and a lot of other things that use sound as communication will also try and use it to startle predators. So if you pick a male cicada up, like, uh, he'll most likely chirp or make that weird buzzing sound because he's trying to scare you away. Like, don't eat me. Look at this loud noise I can make. Another example of this is bees, specifically honeybees. While they have all these other different communication, one of them is piping, and that's when a honeybee will vibrate its wings really, really quickly and create this high-pitched, squeaky, buzzy noise, which you can hear by clicking that video. And this piping behavior is mainly done to move a new a colony or start a new colony. And so a virgin queen will start buzzing, being like, hey, I'm a virgin, so we need to go start a new colony so I can start laying eggs. Or if the colony is getting overcrowded, they'll make a new virgin queen to go and take some of the colony with her. Or if the colony gets damaged, some of them will leave. And so you'll have the, the virgin queen sometimes will do it, and you'll also have like these kind of like director bees that will walk around and like pick certain bees to like go go with them and start the new colonies a certain percentage gets left behind and they'll go up and they'll go like and they'll vibrate their wings super super quickly quickly to make this like high-pitched buzzing noise that's called piping and they'll get the other bees excited and they'll start like walking around really quickly and then they'll all like take off at the same time to go and try and find a new colony but this high-pitched buzzing noise is done by vibrating the wings really really quickly together it's mainly a sound communication and it's to tell other bees, like, hey, let's go find a new place to live. The next way to make sound is to actually just eject fluid or air really quickly from your spiracles. And the main example that I'm most familiar with is the Madagascar and hissing co cockroach. And as you probably guessed from its name, it, it hisses. And it seems to be that this is mostly a startling predator tactic so if you touch it it'll make this really really loud hissing sound and that's because it's actually pushing the air out of its spiracles. Interestingly if you have your own colony which are really easy to take care of and a great pet to have so you literally just like put bread in a jar and just, they just like live and multiply. Anyway um, if you keep handling them over and over and over again they'll actually start to habituate to you and like won't hiss as much so um, it's it's pretty cool and they're a great classroom pet because they hiss and they're big and they crawl on you and they can't hurt you so but they produce sound by pushing air out of their spiracles moving away from sound we now have tactile communication and this is mainly seen in eusocial organisms um, most work has been done with this in the honeybee and so the first example is all of my examples are coming from the honeybees, and while we have videos of these different dances, remember that it's super, super dark inside the hive, and so they're buzzing a little bit, and when they're doing their different dances, the other bees, like, come over and, like, touch and, like, feel where the main scout bee is walking, and so while we see it as a visual cue because we can light up the hive when they're doing this, the other bees are mainly relying on touching the scout bee. So the first dance is a round dance 
and it's kind of not as well known, I guess, as the Waggle Dance, and it's not quite as well studied, so I don't have any cool videos for this, I'm sorry. Um, but the bee will basically walk into the hive and just kind of like wander in like random directions. And this is just telling the other bees that the food source is close by, it's less than 100 meters away, and um, that you should go find it. It has absolutely no directional cues or anything along with it. The only thing that the bees have with them besides like touching and like walking around in random circles is that there's a scent on the bee from the flowers that it was pollinating so the other bees will like sniff the first bee and be like oh you got them from these flowers and they have to be less than 100 meters away and also sometimes the bee will also leave its scent on the flowers that it visited so the bees have both this tactile communication of like this random kind of dance and also the scent communication from the main bee and from the flower that it got that it got the pollen from the most well-known dance from the honeybees is the waggle dance and this dance is so complex and so amazing that we've actually managed to figure it out at least a little bit and so basically the bee will come in from foraging and it does kind of like a figure eight pattern and in the kind of like middle section it'll waggle and that's where it's called the waggle dance it'll like shake its abdomen around so this dance gives information about the distance that the food is so the faster the bee waggles the closer the food is and it also gives um directionality so where can this food be found and it's really really amazing because the scout bee will come back and be dancing for a while to tell all these other bees to like hey there's food out there you should go find it i just found it make sure you go get some and so the bees know what time it is like they can sense polarized light and so they know where the sun is when they entered the hive and they know where the sun was when they found the food and they can keep like a mental track of where the sun is and so if it took them a while to like get to the flower and then get back to the hive they alter their dance based on where the sun is now and so bees can go find it and if they're dancing for a while and the sun position changes they'll change the angle of their dance to communicate exactly where this food source is in relation to the sun so they have their own like time telling mechanism which is really awesome so the bee will come in it'll do this waggle dance and if the food is directly in the direction of the sun the waggle dance part the waggling part is straight and then after that they angle themselves via where the sun is and that tells the other bees where to go so in addition to the speed that the dance is done at and uh, the angle at which the waggling part is done it tells the other bees where food is and how far it is so very much like all the sound stuff that I was talking to you about, I can't really show you a picture of a behavior that happens in response to a thing that you can't see. So there's going to be a lot of videos linked in this main part of the video so you can click and like see these behaviors that I'm talking about. Um, otherwise there's just like a still picture on a PowerPoint slide and you have to use your imagination. We have and by we, I mean biologists have made all these different kind of categories of chemicals that elicit different responses in different organisms so that we can like talk about something as a pheromone, meaning a very specific type that elicits a very specific response. And so a few terms uh, are semiochemical, which is just a chemical substance uh, or a mixture that carries a message in between species or uh, between individuals of the same species. So, you know how we kind of toss around the term pheromone, like, you know, chemicals that elicit responses? Pheromone in biology has, like, a very specific term, and then so semiochemical is kind of, I guess, what people use pheromone as. It's just Semiochemical is just a chemical that elicits a message or a response in anything. So what are all these different types of semiochemicals that I've been talking about? Well, one of the big ones that I keep alluding to are pheromones. And a pheromone is a chemical that is released by an individual of one species to elicit a response or send a message to a member of the same species. So you can't have, like, 
a wasp release a pheromone to stimulate a grasshopper like that that doesn't exist and so pheromones are very very species specific they have a lot of different jobs which we'll talk about but they are only to elicit a response in one species an alimone is a chemical that is secreted by one organism uh, that is beneficial to the to that organism that emitted the chemical but is not beneficial to an organism that receives it and this can be interspecific communication a good example of this is if like a plant releases a chemical that's a toxin or a repellent and the insect picks up on it and then leaves the plant alone and so we use citronella all the time um, this plant oil that we put in candles to make sure mosquitoes don't bite us and so that would be an example of an alimone I mean we're benefiting because we're or the plant is benefiting because they're putting out this chemical that prevents insects from eating them and so not good for the insect because it could be detrimental but definitely good for the plant because the plant doesn't get eaten. A caramone is a chemical that uh, elicits interspecific interactions where the organism that is releasing the chemical is not benefiting but the organism receiving that chemical is. An example of a caramone is with the specific pine tree and the western pine beetle. So when the pine beetle starts munching on the pine tree, the pine tree releases this chemical. Um, it's usually just a chemical that the tree releases saying like, hey, I've been damaged, uh-oh, start fixing things. Um, but this chemical that the tree releases is picked up in the air by others by other pine beetles and they'll all aggregate to this tree and start eating it. And so this chemical is released by the tree. It's definitely not good for the tree, but it's really good for the other beetles that find it and know that there is a food source nearby. And the final one that I'm going to talk about is a cinnamon. And this is a chemical that is secreted by a species which elicits an interspecific reaction where both the emitter and the receiver benefit. And a really, really amazing example of this is if a plant is being eaten by like caterpillars or by aphids, then the plant will oftentimes release a specific chemical and this chemical will be the hey I'm being eaten by this specific thing chemical and that chemical is usually picked up by the parasitoid and the parasitoid receives the plant chemical and then travels to that plant where it knows that there are insects on it that it can parasitize. So this is really really great for the parasitoid because it's getting a host and this is really great for the plant because this thing is coming that's going to kill all the things eating eating it. And so it's it's really cool biology. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the sex pheromones. And so, so many insects use sex pheromones that, I mean, I would be here forever if I were to list off all the examples. But one of the examples that you can see very well is in the example of uh, Saturnid moths. And that's because the males have like giant, huge, super feathery antennae that are like stuck onto their face and they kind of look like, I don't know, brooms or something. And the females have these really kind of skinny, tiny antennae. And it's because the male's antennae are so big so they can be really sensitive and detect female pheromones from incredibly long distances. Like a male moth can find a female up to like six miles away and actually just follow this plume of pheromones to finally get to her. And so what happens is the female releases these pheromones, they obviously travel in the wind, and it's super concentrated right where she is and gradually gets less and less and less and less concentrated as the male or as it goes out. So the male usually starts somewhere near the end or in the middle of the plume. And he'll so their plume is like coming out like basically like a triangle for simplicity's sake. The male will like kind of orient into it and will like fly this way until he can't sense it anymore and then turn around and fly this way until he can't sense it anymore and will just kind of zigzag back and forth throughout this plume so he stays in the middle and um, can follow the concentration gradient of less concentrated to more concentrated until he finally gets to her. And this is how our um, pheromone traps work. So we have a lot for beetles and we have a lot for caterpillars and moths and stuff. And so the female will produce, be producing this big plume. 
And then these traps will also be producing these big plumes of pheromones. And so while the male is trying to follow a female, he'll just jump into any plume at this pheromone is species specific so he doesn't know obviously that it's a trap you've activated my trap card anyway so he'll um go into the plume and then accidentally end up in a trap instead of to an actual female and again we use these for beetles too once again nature is super super crafty and super super tricky and so i love this example very much like how we use the specific pheromones of moths and beetles to attract them into traps. Several orchid species have created uh, pheromones that are identical or so close to that of a bee or a wasp that they'll attract males to the flower. And so this orchid is producing this plume of species-specific pheromone. The bee catches it, follows it, goes into the plume and then ends up in this orchid which is usually shaped somewhat like a female or has the same coloration as the female and so the male is like it smells like her it kind of looks like her must be a female and he'll go over and attempt to mate with the flower and it is not good for him because he's wasting energy and sperm and it's really good for the flower because there's guaranteed pollination that's going to happen so then the male picks up um like the the pollen or the pollen packets and then usually flies away to uh, a different flower uh, because he's confused and will pollinate that one as well and so there's a really great video down there that's that has david attenborough talking about several of these orchid flowers that you can find in europe that do this so basically the male bee thinks that he's getting a female and it's really a tricky orchid. Then there's aggregation pheromone and or swarming pheromone and this is when the when like one organism finds a spot that has good food or is good shelter for overwintering and will send out this pheromone to tell all of its friends or community or others of that species that may need a good spot to hang out here for the time being to get food or stay in overwintering. So um, this is like your locusts. If you've ever had ladybug problems, that's what happens. One finds your house and is like, hey guys, this is going to be super comfy. You guys should come over. And so you get a swarm of ladybugs. And then that's also what happens in the box elder bugs. I don't, I don't know how uh, how much of a pest problem they're here, but uh, in New York where I come from, um, my college dorm room would be covered in box elder bugs all the time whenever the spring came, and it was because of the, this aggregation pheromone. Another example is trail pheromones in ants and in termites and usually in eusocial insects of some sort. But if you've ever left your garbage out for a couple days and you see that very specific trail of ants that have found it, that is all done by the trail pheromones because the first ant that found it releases this trail back to the colony and then all the other colony members are like, oh, follow this, there's food here, and you get that trail of ants to your garbage. Um, if you want a super cool example, the army ants that, that are these permanently mobile colonies in the tropics that just kill anything in its way. Um, move and communicate through this trail pheromone so that way um, the, the insects at the end of the colony can make sure that they're going in the right direction because they're following the trail pheromone set up by all the other ones in front of it. And a super super cool example to do in your classroom and I have a video of it right here is to do this with termites and in Bic and paper mate pens if you draw on the on the paper and put the termites on it they'll follow the trails and that's really amazing it's because there's a uh, this chemical in the pen that very similarly mimics the chemicals that the termites used in in their trail pheromones and so they think that the circle or square whatever that you draw is actually a trail set out by other termites the last pheromone that I'm going to talk about is the alarm pheromone, and I only have one picture of this aphid because usually the alarm pheromone in other insects you can't see. There's no like definite that something is coming out of them. But the aphids have these cornicles, and sometimes they'll release like this orangey goo from the cornicles, and it's thought to be an alarm pheromone because when the insects do this, uh, the rest of their colony just like scatters. 
And so an alarm pheromone is just anything that just elicits a running away response. Like, hey, there's a predator nearby. Run away. And so I have a really cool video. If you click right there, you can watch someone, like, puts, um, like, a syringe and squirts a little bit of alarm pheromone on where there's this colony of aphids and they all just, like, run away and drop off the plant. And it's, and it's pretty cool. Cuticular hydrocarbons aren't a pheromone per se, but they are... A type of communication that is both kind of sensory like smelling and tactile and it's mainly seen in social insects and it's really to just de- to determine your kin from a different kin of the same species and so you'll see this a lot with ants if you've ever like watched ants before they'll like come up to each other and they'll like tap each other with their antennae they're like who are you and that's exactly what they're asking who are you what are you doing where are you coming from and they can tell that this other ant is part of their clan by the hydrocarbon makeup of their cuticle and there's some evidence that suggests that um that certain paper wasps will actually incorporate the nectar and um, the pollen from the nearby trees and the nest makeup into their hydrocarbons and that's how the other wasps in that kin can tell that they're nest mates it's because they have the exact same proportions of like the, the nectar hydrocarbons and all these other things directly infused into their cuticle so it's a little bit tactile because you actually have to like go up and touch the other thing with your antennae, but you're also um, getting a lot of smelling and sensory information from the cute from the cuticular makeup of that organism. And so if ants will like go up to each other and they're like, "You're my species, but not from my colony," they'll like fight and like, kill each other. Of course, there's a cheater in this system. If you've learned anything from this PowerPoint, then you realize there's a cheater in at least all of the systems. And this is a crab spider. It looks nothing like a crab, and it feasts on turtle ants that look nothing like turtles. But, regardless, the while the crab spider looks very similar to the ants, the ants can tell that the crab spider is not part of them because they can walk up to it and touch it with its antennae and be like, your cuticular hydrocarbon makeup is not good. And you only have two segments and not three, so nice try, but we're going to kill you. So the crab spider has uh, developed this pretty interesting behavior where it will find one of the straggler ants, kill it, and then put its dead carcass on its head or carry it around and so when it goes back into the colony to eat more ants the ants of that colony touch it and are like and then end up touching the dead ant and be like well yes your cuticular hydrocarbon makeup is correct you may enter and so the crab spider enters the colony and just like eats a ton of ants and it's awesome So this was part one of module five. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I really think that insect communication is really fascinating. Hopefully you did too. Next week is sociality and insects. So who is truly eusocial, like the bees and the wasps, who displays sociality but isn't quite eusocial, and how does eusociality evolve? So if those topics seem interesting to you, then you should watch the video for next week, which will be up there as soon as it is uploaded.